Hello friends, this is Grief speaking. I recently fell down a rabbit hole concerning human experimentation and unethical medical studies. Before I knew it, I had quite a bit of research under my belt and I figured, why not make a video on the subject? So today we're going to be looking at 15 horrifying human experiments from across history, ranging from some unethical and frowned upon studies done to children, to truly disturbing surgeries and body mutilation done during World War II. While it's a little subjective, I've arranged the video by how disturbing and damaging I think the experiments are, so it'll become more unsettling as the video goes on, and just a fair warning, some of these are pretty graphic and unpleasant to hear about, so continue at your own discretion, especially as we get into the last few on the list. But I think that's all I got for now, so let's just get right into the list. So let's start off with the Milgram experiment. The Milgram experiment might stand out here because no one was hurt by it, but the results are a little disturbing. The experiment goes like this. Two men are assigned the positions of teacher and learner, with the learner being put into a room and hooked up to an electroshock machine. The teacher is meant to ask the learner questions, and when the learner is incorrect, they must administer a shock, increasing the voltage with every wrong answer. This is all put into action by the experimenter, an authority figure in a white lab coat. As the learner continues to be shocked, he eventually refuses to continue and demands to be let out as he has a heart condition and is afraid he could die. 150 volts. Oh. Experimenter, that's all. Get me out of here. He's I told quit. you I had heart trouble. My heart's starting to bother me now. Get me out of here, please. My heart's starting to bother me. I refuse to go on. Let me out. Here's the thing. The learner is actually an actor who's not being shocked at all, but the teacher doesn't know that. Well, despite the teacher being skeptical as it appears the learner is being harmed, they continue to increase the voltage as long as the authority figure insists, long past the point where if the shocks were real, they would have killed the person. This will be at 3.30. The correct phrase is rich Let me out of boy. Here. You have no right to hold me here. The next phrase is Let fast. Out. Let me out, let me out, let me out of here, let me out. 40 men from ages 20 to 50 with varying backgrounds participated in this experiment and all of them continued up to 300 volts with 65% of the participants going to the full 450 volts. The disturbing results seem to show how willing people are to commit potentially harmful acts as long as they're administered by an authority figure. Just how far can you go in this thing? As far as is necessary. What do you mean as far as is necessary? Little Albert. The Little Albert experiment was a study done in 1920 on classical conditioning. The idea was to see if a phobia could be conditioned into an emotionally stable child. The experiment went like this. They took a healthy nine-month-old baby, who they call Albert, although this wasn't his real name, and exposed him to a variety of furry animals and objects like a white lab rat, a monkey, a rabbit, furry masks, and cotton. As expected, Albert had no issues with these things and even enjoyed playing around Around with them. In the second phase of the study, they exposed Albert once again to the stimuli, only this time, as soon as Albert interacted with them, the researchers struck a steel bar with a hammer to make a loud, shocking noise right behind Albert. Of course, the poor kid immediately freaks out every time. In the final part of this test, they once again introduced the animals and objects to little Albert, and Albert was distressed immediately upon interacting with them. So, they basically traumatized this kid in the process. There's kind of an interesting part of this, which is that people have been trying to discover the true identity of Albert for a long time, and there have been several claims about it, although I think they've all been contested. The Monster Study the monster study, while not a physical experiment, had major psychological effects on subjects and has been named the monster study due to how unethical these tests were. In 1939, Davenport, Iowa, psychologist Wendell Johnson conducted a speech therapy study at the University of Iowa on 22 orphan children. The intention of the study was to find out whether positive and negative reinforcement in stutterers would have an effect. The idea was to separate the kids into two groups. One, given positive reinforcement about their speech by telling them that they didn't stutter and that they spoke normally, even if they actually did have a stutter. The other group were labeled stutterers and constantly reprimanded for the way they spoke, even if they weren't stuttering and spoke normally. The study concluded that there were basically no changes in the positive group, but the negative group came out significantly worse at speaking, with many of the children actually developing a stutter and some even refusing to speak altogether, becoming socially withdrawn. Yeah, so these kids' lives were ruined and you can see why it was labeled the monster study. It was hidden away 
way to try and save Johnson's reputation, but came to light years later by Mary Tudor, a graduate student who did the actual interviews with the children. The thing is, this study actually did achieve its goal in learning some things about the psychology around child speech, but obviously at a steep cost. The Stanford Prison Experiments You may have heard about this one before, as it was covered all over this side of YouTube a few years back. Vsauce did a minefield episode about it, and there was even a feature film about it starring Ezra Miller. Well, in case you missed this one, I'll give you the gist of it. In the 1970s, the US military were interested in learning about the power hierarchies within military prisons. So researcher Philip Zimbardo was issued a grant to conduct studies on the topic leading to this now famous experiment. The idea was to make a mock prison environment in order to study the relationships between prisoners and guards. So an ad was put out asking for male college students willing to participate in a psychological study over the course of two weeks and paying $15 a day. 70 applicants applied. Any with a criminal record or mental disorders were ruled out, and eventually they had their test group of 24 young men. These men were divided into two groups, prisoners and guards, and to avoid selection bias, these groups were picked by a coin toss. The guards were given uniforms and nightsticks while the prisoners were put into smocks without any undergarments and were forced to wear skin-tight nylon on their heads to simulate having their heads shaved. Each prisoner was given a number and were only allowed to call themselves and other prisoners by these numbers, further dehumanizing them. The researcher, Zimbardo, was more directly involved in it by playing the part of the warden. Almost immediately, the guards became sadistic, mistreating the prisoners in any way they saw fit, besides physical violence, which was the only thing left off limits. This caused the prisoners to rebel on day two, which led to the guards being even more cruel, removing the prisoners' beds and making them use a bucket as a toilet. They ended up making a cell for prisoners who behaved, in which there were beds. This caused some friction between the inmates, of course, and after only a few days, several inmates were having mental breakdowns. Eventually, they set up a mock probation board to interview the prisoners, and the inmates began to truly believe they were really in a prison. At this point, another researcher, Christina Maslach, was brought into the experiment to observe and was like, what the f*** are you guys even doing? At this point, Zimbardo realized he himself had begun taking his warden role a little too seriously and stopped the experiment, seemingly regretful. This was just a quick version. There's a lot to this one, so I recommend researching for yourself all the details, but it's pretty insane. The Vipoem Experiments In 1938, the National Dental Service of Sweden was founded, and at the time, dental health was not very well researched. While there was a suspicion that high sugar diets caused tooth decay, this wasn't scientifically proven which led to a study on the subject at Vipholm Hospital, Sweden's largest mental institution. Initially, this started out as government-sanctioned vitamin trials in 1945. However, in 1947, this was converted into a completely different experiment without the government knowing. The study consisted of a group of patients being fed large amounts of sweets with the intent to fully decay their teeth. This lasted for two years, and by the end of the experiment, over 600 patients had severely damaged their teeth, and 50 of which had none left. Like all the these scumbags, the researchers saw it as a huge success as it proved their theory that sugar caused tooth decay. MK Ultra. You've likely heard of MK Ultra, but just in case, let's go over it. It was a covert CIA program initiated in the early 1950s as part of a broader series of experiments aimed at developing techniques for mind control, information gathering, and psychological torture. The project was a response to Cold War era fears, particularly concerning the supposed brainwashing of American prisoners of war by the Chinese during the Korean War. The most notable aspect of MKUltra involved experiments with psychoactive substances, namely LSD. They wanted to see if these drugs could be used for mind control or interrogation. Subjects, including both willing and unwilling individuals, were given the drugs often without their knowledge or informed consent. In cases where they did inform the participants, they would do more extreme tests, like taking seven drug addicts and having them take LSD for 77 days straight, completely frying their brains. Beyond drugs, MKUltra also explored the potential of other methods in mind control control, including hypnosis, sensory deprivation, isolation, verbal and sexual abuse, and various forms of torture. There was also some experiments done in Canada by a psychiatrist named Donald Cameron who engaged in experiments with various muscle relaxing drugs and conducted electroconvulsive therapy at intensities 30 to 40 times higher than usual. His technique involved inducing drug-based comas in patients for extended periods, sometimes up to three months. During these comas, patients were exposed to continuous audio loops of noise or simple 
simple repetitive statements. These experiments were frequently performed on individuals who sought treatment for common mental health issues such as anxiety disorders and postpartum depression. As you might expect, many of these patients endured lasting damage due to his methods. The severe outcomes of his treatments included urinary incontinence, memory loss, an inability to speak, loss of memory about their own parents, and a distorted belief that their captors were their parents. Absolutely wild. The Tuskegee Study The Tuskegee Study is a really dark chapter in American history. It was a study done in 1932 on 600 black men from Tuskegee, Alabama, with the intention to learn more about the STD syphilis, which at the time was not treatable. The horrible part about all this is that the men were told they were being treated for bad blood, which was a local term for a range of illnesses. However, they were never being treated at all, just observed to see the long-term effects of syphilis. The men never even knew that they had syphilis, and when penicillin became their primary treatment for the disease, it was withheld from them. I'll state the obvious, syphilis is a horrible disease that leaves its victims in agonizing pain, disfigurement, and eventually death. So this study went on for 40 years before it was revealed to the general public when one of the men brought the story to a civil rights attorney and the Associated Press ran a story on it. This eventually resulted in a class action lawsuit where the study participants and their descendants were paid 10 million by the US government. Now let's tackle the Guatemala syphilis study. While the Tuskegee study is more well known, there was actually another unethical syphilis study that began in 1946 in Guatemala. It was led by John Charles Cutler who was actually involved in the later stages of the Tuskegee study. Well in this experiment, the US infected over 1300 people with syphilis and gonorrhea. They took people from impoverished communities such as orphans, sex workers, mental patients, and prisoners. Once again, many of these people were lied to being told that they were getting free health care. At least these experiments were in the interest of seeing the effects of penicillin on these STDs, but out of the 1300 or so participants, only 700 were actually treated. The insane part of this is that the way these people were infected in the first place was by having intercourse with infected prostitutes, meaning that the US government used American tax dollars in order to pay for sex workers for the test subjects. That's so crazy. Camera. The Soviet secret services operated a secret poison laboratory known under several names including Laboratory 1, Laboratory 12, and Camera, or the cell in Russian. The objective of the lab was to develop a poison that would be undetectable after death. They did this by poisoning gulag prisoners with various toxins like mustard gas, cyanide, and many others. This was unbeknownst to the inmates who were told they were taking medication and the toxins would be served alongside a meal or beverage. Eventually they developed a poison known as C2 or K2 that was highly effective. According to witness testimonies, the victims experienced physical changes such as rapid weakening and diminishment in height, followed by a calm and silent demeanor culminating in death within 15 minutes. That's an eerie description testicle transplants. So in 1913, San Quentin Prison hired a man named Leo Stanley as the prison's chief surgeon. Here's the thing, Leo Stanley had no surgical experience at all and was actually kind of a lunatic. Being a strong proponent of eugenics, believing that all prisoners should be sterilized and that childbearing was meant for the fit. Well, besides that wild take, the dude was doing all kinds of weird experiments, the strangest being testicle transplants. He believed in a strange theory at the time called testicle grafting, in which transplanting a testicle could cause age reversal and male rejuvenation. So he was putting all kinds of testicles all kinds of places. Dead prisoner testicles along with a variety of animal testicles were surgically transplanted into living prisoners eventually performing over 10,000 of these transplants. And the crazy thing is he was praised for this at the time as if he was this new and promising surgeon advancing modern medicine. I mean what can I say this story is just nuts. Human blood transfusion. The history of blood transfusion is actually really brutal. The practice dates back to ancient times, initial experiments with animal blood and human blood were done without clear understanding of blood types or the principles of immunology. This led to numerous deaths as the importance of blood compatibility just wasn't known yet. One particularly gruesome example comes from a man named Jean Baptiste Dennis, a French physician who played a significant role in the early history of blood transfusions as he was one of the first to experiment with transfusing animal blood into humans. His most famous series of transfusions involved Antoine Moroy, a mentally ill man in the 1660s. Dennis believed that transfusing lamb's blood into Moroy would cure his mental illness based on a popular theory which suggested that mental and physical health was determined by the balance of bodily fluids. Dennis's first attempt was pretty freaky as shortly after injecting the lamb's blood, Moroy experienced fever, nausea, diarrhea, abundant sweating, a continuous nosebleeds, and urine that was quote as black as chimney soot. The weird thing is this actually subsided and Moroy fully recovered. However, this 
This was likely a placebo effect or coincidence as Maroy after just a couple of months was even more insane than before. So Dennis was back at it again with the lamb's blood. After two more transfusions, Maroy began violently shaking and eventually died. James Marion Sims. James Marion Sims was a prominent surgeon in the 1800s known for developing a surgical technique to repair a vesicovaginal fistula, a condition that was common after childbirth at the time and led to incontinence and hygiene issues. Well, look, that's all good and well, except that the dude conducted his experiments on enslaved black women and did not use anesthesia. While there were multiple test subjects, the most notable is Anarcha Westcott. She had several tears in her vagina and rectum, which caused excruciating pain as she constantly lost control of her urine and bowels. Just horrible. Well, Sims performed over 30 operations on her without anesthesia, leaving Anarcha to deal with unimaginable pain throughout. At one point, he even left an entire sponge inside of her. The crazy thing is, anesthesia had actually recently become available, but Sims just refused to use it. The Holmesburg Experiments Albert Kligman was a dermatologist who is most well known for conducting unethical human experiments at Holmesburg Prison in Philadelphia. His initial involvement at the prison began with efforts to control athlete's foot, but he quickly realized the potential for broader research. From 1951 to 1974, he engaged in numerous experiments, often funded by pharmaceutical companies and government agencies. His most notable work at Holmesburg involved exposing around 75 prisoners to high doses of dioxin, which is a toxic component of Agent Orange in studies sponsored by Dow Chemical. Inmates were paid for their participation, making these experiments a significant source of income for them. However, However, it was highly coercive and the inmates had no idea what they were getting into. These solutions mutilated prisoners in different ways like corroding and reducing the forearm epidermis to a leather-like substance and acids which blistered skin. In addition to the exposure to harmful chemical agents, patients were asked to physically exert themselves and then were immediately put under the knife to remove sweat glands for examination. Even more disturbing, they took fragments of dead bodies and stitched them into the backs of inmates to try and grow them back into functional organs. If Dr. Kligman doesn't already sound like an evil scientist out of a movie, he said this about first entering the prison. All I saw before me were acres of skin. It was like a farmer seeing a fertile field for the first time. I mean, this sounds like a monologue from American Psycho. All right, getting even darker here, let's talk about the Nazi human experiments. Between 1942 and 1945, the Nazis began doing experiments on concentration camp inmates in order to study the effects of war and how they might be treated. These experiments were done without the consent of the victims and were nothing short of torture, as many of the victims were left mutilated, disabled, and dead. Well, obviously this is quite disturbing, but I'll give you a brief summary of some of these experiments. High altitude tests were done in which inmates were placed in pressure chambers in order to simulate high altitudes of up to 68,000 feet to see what their physiological state would look like, and some even had their brains dissected during the process. Half of the participants died in these tests and the survivors were executed. Some experiments were done to try and find an effective treatment for infections on the battlefield. In order to test this, they sliced open inmates' legs and infected the wounds with bacteria like tetanus and gangrene, and then rubbed dirt, glass, and wood shavings into into the wound in order to replicate a field wound. Brutal. They also attempted to transplant limbs by chopping off arms and legs from inmates and attempting to sew them back onto soldiers who had lost these limbs. Obviously this didn't work and dozens of prisoners had their appendages amputated for no reason, many of which died. Some experiments were done in the interest of finding a way to successfully drink seawater. So 90 gypsies were forced to drink only seawater, which dehydrated them to the point that they would lick freshly mopped floors just to try and get normal water. A lot of these more terrible experiments were done by a man named Joseph Mengele who had a fascination with physical oddities such as dwarfs, twins, and people with two different eye colors, often singling these people out for bizarre procedures. He apparently did all kinds of strange and cruel things like remove organs from still conscious inmates, inject chemicals into their eyes to try and change their color, and was even said to pin humans up on walls like butterflies. This guy was a truly sadistic psychopath and sounds like a fictional horror villain from a torture film. In fact, he was actually a large part of the inspiration for the human centipede. And finally, let's talk about Unit 731. This was another one that really blew up over the last couple of years, and for good reason. It's pretty terrible. Unit 731 was a biological and chemical warfare research unit in the Imperial Japanese Army during World War II. The purpose of the unit was to conduct research using human experimentation in order to develop new weapons. The most horrific tests were done in order to understand what kind of pain and damage the human body could 
endure and still survive. One of the most horrific examples is that they would take victims out into the cold and splash them with water until their limbs were frozen solid just so they could experiment on how to unfreeze them. They would test weapons like rifles, grenades, and even flamethrowers on prisoners, and they performed many strange operations on people, slicing them open while they were still alive. They were put into pressure chambers until their eyeballs popped out of their heads, and worst of all, many women were forced into pregnancy and experimented on, with any surviving children then being the test subjects themselves. It's all really disturbing and horrible stuff, and if you want more graphic details, there are hour-long videos on the subject, so check those out at your own discretion. The Russian Dog Experiments Okay, this one's not technically a human experiment, but I threw it on there as a little bonus because of just how disturbing it is. You've probably seen it on the dark side of YouTube, but in the 1940s, Russian scientists were doing tests regarding the reanimation of dead organisms, and many of these were filmed and put together into a 20-minute short educational film known as Experiments in the Revival of Organisms. In the film, several organs from a dog are seen being reanimated. For example, a dog's heart pumping as if it were still living. But the standout part of the whole thing namely because it is so disturbing to watch, is when they reanimate the severed head of a dog. Yeah, it's some real Frankenstein shit and is just inarguably creepy. This was one of those videos that was hard to make without losing a little faith in humanity. The details of a lot of these experiments were definitely horrific. It also opens up an interesting discussion because some of these experiments help to further medical research in different areas and are still cited to this day, which naturally can rub people the wrong way. While the research was collected through terrible and inhumane means, it's still useful, which makes it an interesting gray area of science. Anyway, I hope you found it interesting and informative. I want to give a big shout out to my patrons, Naomi Romero, Soma, Krusty the Crab, One Group, Ali Morgan, Laz Wishgender, Malediction, Hunter Piva, Tora, Heather M, Creepy Pasta Cube, A Slightly Bigger Ant, Hannah Broadstreet, K.A., Ricky Shadow, Chase Middleton, Koi Koi, Matt Rozak, and Momomochi. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for all the support. But as always, I appreciate you guys watching at all, so thank you. This is Grief speaking. Goodbye, friends.